Catherine Murray Millett September 14, 1934 to September 6, 2017, was an American feminist writer, educator, artist, and activist. She attended Oxford University and was the first American woman to be awarded a degree with first-class honors after studying at St. Hilda's College, Oxford. She has been described as a seminal influence on second-wave feminism and is best known for her book Sexual Politics 1970, which was based on her doctoral dissertation at Columbia University. Journalist Liza Featherstone attributes previously unimaginable legal abortion, greater professional equality between the sexes, and a sexual freedom being made possible partially due to Millet's efforts, the feminist, human rights, peace, civil rights, and anti-psychiatry movements were some of Millet's principal causes. Her books were motivated by her activism, such as women's rights and mental health reform, and several were autobiographical memoirs that explored her sexuality, mental health, and relationships. In the 1960s and 1970s, Millet taught at Waseda University, Bryn Mawr College, Barnard College, and the University of California, Berkeley. Some of her later written works are The Politics of Cruelty 1994, about state-sanctioned torture in many countries, and Mother Millet 2001, a book about her relationship with her mother. Between 2011 and 2013, she won the Lambda Pioneer Award for Literature, received Yoko Ono's Courage Award for the Arts, and was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. Millet was born and raised in Minnesota, and then spent most of her adult life in Manhattan and the Woman's Art Colony, established in Poughkeepsie, New York, which became the Millet Center for the Arts in 2012. Millet came out as a lesbian in the year the book Sexual Politics was published. She was married to a sculptor Fumio Yoshimura and later, until her death in 2017, she was married to Sophie Kier. Early life and education Catherine Murray Millett was born on September 14, 1934 to James Albert and Helen Millett in St. Paul, Minnesota. According to Millett, she was afraid of her father, an engineer, who beat her. He was an alcoholic who abandoned the family when she was 14, consigning them to a life of genteel poverty. Her mother was a teacher and insurance saleswoman. She had two sisters, Sally and Mallory, the latter was one of the subjects of three lives. Of Irish Catholic heritage, Kate Millett attended parochial schools in St. Paul throughout her childhood. Millett graduated in 1956 magna cum laude from the University of Minnesota with a Bachelor of Arts degree in English Literature. She was a member of the Kappa Alpha Theta sorority. A wealthy aunt paid for her education at St. Hilda's College, Oxford gaining an English literature first-class degree, with honors, in 1958. She was the first American woman to be awarded a degree with first-class honors having studied at St. Hilda's. After spending about ten years as an educator and artist, Millett entered the graduate school program for English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University in 1968, during which she taught English at Barnard. While there, she championed student rights, women's liberation, and abortion reform. She completed her dissertation in September 1969 and was awarded her doctorate, with distinction, in March 1970. <laughs> <laughs> Career and activism Early career as an artist and educator Millett taught English at the University of North Carolina after graduating from Oxford University, but she left mid semester to study art. In New York City, she worked as a kindergarten teacher and learned to sculpt and paint from 1959 to 61. She then moved to Japan and studied sculpture. Millet met fellow sculptor Fumio Yoshimura, had her first one-woman show at Tokyo's Minami Gallery, and taught English at Waseda University. She left Japan in 1963 and moved to New York's Lower East Side. Millet taught English and exhibited her works of art at Barnard College beginning in 1964. She was among a group of young, radical and untenured educators who wanted to modernize women's education. Millet wanted to provide them with the critical tools necessary to understand their position in a patriarchal society." Her viewpoints on radical politics, her "...stinging attack," 
against Barnard in token learning, and a budget cut at the college led to her being dismissed on December 23, 1968. Her artwork was featured in an exhibit at Greenwich Village's Judson Gallery. During these years Millet became interested in the peace and civil rights movement, joined the Congress of Racial Equality Corps, and participated in their protests. In 1971, Millet taught sociology at Bryn Mawr College. She started buying and restoring property that year, near Poughkeepsie, New York. This became the Women's Art Colony and Tree Farm, a community of women artists and writers and Christmas tree farm. Two years later she was an educator at the University of California, Berkeley. <laughs> Feminism and sexuality Feminism Millet was a leading figure in the women's movement, or second-wave feminism, of the 1960s and 1970s. In 1966, Millet became a committee member of National Organization for Women and subsequently joined the New York Radical Women, Radical Lesbians, and Downtown Radical Women organizations. She contributed the piece, Sexual Politics in Literature. To the 1970 anthology Sisterhood is Powerful, an anthology of writings from the women's liberation movement, edited by Robin Morgan, she became a spokesperson for the feminist movement following the success of the book Sexual Politics 1970, but struggled with conflicting perceptions of her as arrogant and elitist, and the expectations of others to speak for them, which she covered in her 1974 book, Flying. Millet was one of the first writers to describe the modern concept of patriarchy as the society-wide subjugation of women. Biographer Gail Graham Yates said that, "...Millet articulated a theory of patriarchy and conceptualized the gender and sexual oppression of women in terms that demanded a sex role revolution with radical changes of personal and family lifestyles." Betty Friedan's focus, by comparison, was to improve leadership opportunities socially and politically and economic independence for women. Millet wrote several books on women's lives from a feminist perspective. For instance, in the book The Basement, Meditations on a Human Sacrifice 1979, completed over four years, she chronicled the torture and murder of Indianapolis teenager Sylvia Likens by Gertrude Banaszewski in 1965 that had preoccupied her for 14 years. With a feminist perspective, she explored the story of the defenseless girl and the dynamics of the individuals involved in her sexual, physical and emotional abuse. Biographer Roberta M. Hooks wrote, Quite apart from any feminist polemics, The Basement can stand alone as an intensely felt and movingly written study of the problems of cruelty and submission." Millet said of the motivation of the perpetrator, "...it is the story of the suppression of women. Gertrude seems to have wanted to administer some terrible truthful justice to this girl, that this was what it was to be a woman." Millet and Sophie Keir, a Canadian journalist, travelled to Tehran, Iran in 1979 for the Committee for Artistic and Intellectual Freedom to work for Iranian women's rights. Their trip followed actions taken by Ayatollah Khomeini's government to prevent girls from attending schools with boys, to require working women to wear veils, and not to allow women to divorce their husbands. Thousands of women attended a protest rally held at Tehran University on International Women's Day, March 8. About 20,000 women attended a march through the city's Freedom Square, many of whom were stabbed, beaten, or threatened with acid. Millet and Keir, who had attended the rallies and demonstrations, were removed from their hotel room and taken to a locked room in immigration headquarters two weeks after they arrived in Iran. They were threatened that they might be put in jail and, knowing that homosexuals were executed in Iran, Millet also feared she might be killed when she overheard officials discuss her lesbianism. After an overnight stay, the women were put on a plane that landed in Paris. Although Millet was relieved to have arrived safely in France, she was worried about the fate of Iranian women left behind. They can't get on a plane. That's why international sisterhood is so important. She wrote about the experience in her 1981 book Going to Iran. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Sexual Politics. Sexual politics originated as Millet's Ph.D. dissertation and was published in 1970, the same year that she was awarded her doctorate from Columbia University. 
The best-selling book, A Critique of Patriarchy in Western Society and Literature, addressed the sexism and heterosexism of the modern novelists D. H. Lawrence, Henry Miller, and Norman Mailer and contrasted their perspectives with the dissenting viewpoint of the homosexual author Jean Genet. Millet questioned the origins of patriarchy, argued that sex-based oppression was both political and cultural, and posited that undoing the traditional family was the key to true sexual revolution. In its first year on the market, the book sold 80,000 copies and went through seven printings and is considered to be the movement's manifesto. As a symbol of the women's liberation movement, Millet was featured in a Time magazine cover story, The Politics of Sex, which called sexual politics a remarkable book that provided a coherent theory about the feminist movement. Alice Neal created the depiction of Millet for the August 31, 1970 cover. According to biographer Peter Manso, The Prisoner of Sex was written by Norman Mailer in response to Millet's sexual politics. The prisoner of sex is structured as a contest. His rhetoric against her prose, his charm against her earnestness, his polemic rage against her vitriolic charges. The aim is to convert the larger audience, the stronger presence as the sustaining truth. The prisoner of sex combines self-parody and satire," said Andrew Wilson, author of Norman Mailer, an American aesthetic. <laughs> Sexism and sexuality While Millet was speaking about sexual liberation at Columbia University, a woman in the audience asked her, Why don't you say you're a lesbian, here, openly? You've said you were a lesbian in the past. Millet hesitantly responded, Yes, I am a lesbian. A couple of weeks later, Time's December 8, 1970 article, Women's Lib, A Second Look, reported that Millet admitted she was bisexual, which it said would likely discredit her as a spokesperson for the feminist movement because it reinforced d the views of those skeptics who routinely dismiss all liberationists as lesbians. In response, two days later a press conference was organized by feminists Ivy Bottini and Barbara Love in Greenwich Village in which they spoke of their solidarity with the struggle of homosexuals to attain their liberation in a sexist society. To Kate Millett and other attendees, Millett's 1971 film Three Lives is a 16mm documentary made by an all-woman crew, including co-director Susan Kleckner, cameraperson Lenore Bode, and editor Robin Mead, under the name Women's Liberation Cinema. The 70-minute film focuses on three women, Mallory Millett Jones, the director's sister, Lillian Shreve, a chemist, and Robin Mead, an artist, reminiscing about their lives. Vincent Canby, the New York Times art critic, wrote, Three Lives is a good, simple movie in that it can't be bothered to call attention to itself, only to its three subjects, and to how they grew in the same male-dominated society that Miss Millet, in her sexual politics, so systematically tore apart, shook up, ridiculed and undermined—while, apparently, tickling it pink. It received, generally excellent reviews. Following its premiere at a New York City theater, in her 1971 book The Prostitution Papers, Millet interprets prostitution as residing at the core of the female's condition, exposing women's subjection more clearly than is done with marriage contracts. According to her, degradation and power, not sex, are being bought and sold in prostitution. She argues for the decriminalization of prostitution in a process directed by the sex workers themselves. In 1974 and 1977, respectively, Millet published two autobiographical books. Flying 1974, a stream of consciousness memoir about her bisexuality, which explores her life after the success of sexual politics in what was described in the New York Times book review as an example of dazzling exhibitionism. Millet captured life as she thought, experienced and lived it, in a style like a documentary film. Sita 1977 explores her sexuality, particularly her lesbian lover who committed suicide and the effect on Millet's personal and private life. In an interview with Mark Blasius, Millet was sympathetic to the concept of intergenerational sex, describing age of consent laws as very oppressive to gay male youth in particular but repeatedly reminding the interviewer that the question cannot rest on the sexual access of older men or women to children but a rethinking of children's rights broadly understood. Millet added that, "...one of children's essential rights is to express themselves sexually, probably primarily with each other but with adults as well." 
and that, "...the sexual freedom of children is an important part of a sexual revolution if you don't change the social condition of children you still have an inescapable inequality." In this interview, Millett criticized those who wished to abolish age of consent laws, saying the issue was not focused on children's rights but being approached as the right of men to have sex with kids below the age of consent, and added that, no mention is made of relationships between women and girls. Millet is featured in the feminist history film She's Beautiful When She's Angry, 2014. The 1980s through 2000s In 1980, Millet was one of the ten invited artists whose work was exhibited in the Great American Lesbian Art Show at the Woman's Building in Los Angeles. Millet was a contributor to On the Issues magazine, and continued writing into the early 2000s. She discussed state-sanctioned torture in The Politics of Cruelty 1994, bringing attention to the use of torture in many countries. Millet was involved in the controversy resulting from her appearance on a UK television programme called After Dark, when alcoholic actor Oliver Reed, who had been drinking during a break, moved in on her and tried to kiss her. Millet pushed him away but allegedly later asked for a tape of the show to entertain her friends. Throughout the program Reed used sexist language. Millet was also involved in prison reform and campaigns against torture. Journalist Maureen Freely wrote of Millet's viewpoint regarding activism in her later years, the best thing about being a freewheeler is that she can say what she pleases because nobody's giving me a chair in anything. I'm too old, mean and ornery. Everything depends on how well you argue. Topic. Mother Millet Kate wrote Mother Millet 2001 about her mother who in her later years developed several serious health problems, including a brain tumor and hypercalcemia. Made aware of her mother's declining health, Millet visited her in Minnesota. Their visits included conversations about their relationship and outings to baseball games, museums, and restaurants. When her mother was no longer able to care for herself in her apartment, she was placed in a nursing home in St. Paul, Minnesota, which was one of Helen Millett's greatest fears. Kate visited her mother and was disturbed by the care she received and her mother's demoralized attitude. Nursing home residents who were labeled as behavioral problems, as Helen was, were subject to forcible restraint. Helen said to Kate, Now that you're here, we can leave. Aware of the efforts her mother made to give her life, support her and raise her, Millet became a caregiver and coordinator of many daily therapies, and pushed her mother to be active. She wanted to give her independence and dignity. In the article, Her Mother, Herself, Pat Swift wrote, Helen Millet might have been content to go gently into that good night. She was after all more afraid of the nursing home than dying, but daughter Kate was having none of that. Feminist warrior, human rights activists, gay liberationist, writer and artist, Kate Millett has not gone gently through life and never hesitates to rage at anyone—friend or foe, family or the system—to right a perceived wrong. When the dignity and quality of her ailing mother's life was at stake, this book's unfolding tale became inevitable. Even though Helen played a role in having her daughter committed to the University of Minnesota's Mayo Wing, Kate had her mother removed from the nursing home and returned to her apartment, where attendants managed her care. During this period, Millet could also bully her mother for her lack of cultural sophistication and the amount of television she watched and could be harsh with caregivers. <laughs> Millet Center for the Arts In 2012, the Women's Art Colony became a 501 nonprofit organization and changed its name to the Millet Center for the Arts. Personal life Interpersonal relationships Millet was not the polite, middle-class girl," that many parents of her generation and social circle desired, she could be difficult, brutally honest, and tenacious. Liza Featherstone, author of, "'Daughterhood is Powerful," says that these qualities helped to make her, 
one of the most influential radical feminists of the 1970s. They could also make for difficult interpersonal relationships. Millet wrote several autobiographical memoirs, with what Featherstone calls brutal honesty about herself, her husband, lovers, and family. Her relationship with her mother was strained by her radical politics, domineering personality, and unconventional lifestyle. Helen was particularly upset about examination of her lesbianism in her books. Family relationships were further strained after she was involuntarily committed to psychiatric wards and again when she wrote The Looney Bin Trip, Millet focused on her mother in Mother Millet, a book about how she was made aware by her sister Sally of the seriousness of Helen Millet's declining health and poor nursing home care. Kate removed her mother from the home and returned her to an apartment, where caregivers managed her health and comfort. In the book, Millet writes about the situation her mother's distance and imperiousness, her family's failure to recognize the humanity of the old and the insane with brutal honesty. Yet she also describes moments of forgiveness, humility, and admiration. During this time, she developed a close relationship, previously inconceivable, with her mother, which she considered a miracle and a grace, a gift. Her relationships with her sisters were troubled during this time, but they all came to support their mother's apartment living. The suggestion of her role as the heroine in Mother Millet, however, may have been at the expense of her two siblings. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Marriage. In 1961, Millet moved to Japan and met fellow sculptor Fumio Yoshimura, the widower of a woman named Yoshiko. A Japanese native, Yoshimura studied painting at Tokyo University of the Arts. In 1963 Yoshimura and Millet left Japan and moved to New York's Lower East Side in the Bowery District. In 1965, the couple married and during their marriage Millet said that they were "...friends and lovers." She dedicated her book Sexual Politics to him. Author Estelle C. Jelinek says that during their marriage he "...loves her, leads his own creative life, and accepts her woman lovers." In 1985, the couple divorced. At the time of her death, Millet was married to Sophie Keir. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Mental illness. Mental illness affected Millet's personal and professional life from 1973, when she lived with her husband in California and was an activist and teacher at the University of California, Berkeley. Yoshimura and Sally, Kate's eldest sister, became concerned about Kate's extreme emotions. Her family claimed that she went for as many as five consecutive nights without sleep and could talk nonsensically for hours. During a screening of one of her films at University of California, Berkeley, Millet began talking incoherently. According to her sister, Mallory Millet Danaher, there were pained looks of confusion in the audience, then people whispered and slowly got up to leave. Sally, who was a law student in Nebraska, signed papers to have her younger sister committed. Millet was forcefully taken and held in psychiatric facilities for 10 days. She signed herself out using a release form intended for voluntary admissions. During a visit to St. Paul, Minnesota, a couple of weeks later, her mother asked Kate to visit a psychiatrist and, based upon the psychiatrist's suggestion, signed commitment papers for Kate. She was released within three days, having won a sanity trial, due to the efforts of her friends and a pro bono attorney. Following the two involuntary confinements, Millet became depressed, particularly so about having been confined without due process. While in the mental hospitals, she was given mind altering drugs or restrained, depending upon whether she complied or not. She was stigmatized for having been committed and diagnosed with manic depression, now commonly called bipolar disorder. The diagnosis affected how she was perceived by others and her ability to attain employment. In California doctors had recommended that she take lithium to manage wide manic and depression swings. Her depression became more severe when her housing in the Bowery was condemned and Yoshimura threatened divorce. To manage the depression, Millet again began taking lithium. In 1980, with support of two friends and photojournalist Sophie Keir, Millet stopped taking lithium to improve her mental clarity, relieve diarrhea and hand tremors, and better uphold her philosophies about mental health and treatment. She began to feel alienated and was snappish as Keir watched for behavioral changes. Her behavior was that of psychiatric drug withdrawal, including mile a minute 
speech, which turned her peaceful art colony to a quarrelsome dystopia. Mallory Millett, having talked to Keir, tried to get her committed but was unsuccessful due to New York's laws concerning involuntary commitments. Millett visited Ireland in the fall of 1980 as an activist. Upon her intended return to the United States, there was a delay at the airport and she extended her stay in Ireland. She was involuntarily committed in Ireland after airport security, determined from someone in New York, that she had a mental illness and had stopped taking lithium. While confined, she was heavily drugged. To combat the aggressive pharmaceutical program of the worst bin of all, she counteracted the effects of Thorazine and lithium by eating a lot of oranges or hid the pills in her mouth for later disposal. She said of the times when she was committed, to remain sane in a bin is to defy its definition, she said. Millet describes with loathing the days of television-induced boredom, nights of drug-induced terror, people deprived of a sense of time, of personal dignity, even of hope. What crime justifies being locked up like this, Millet asks. How can one not be crazy in such a place? After several days, she was found by her friend Margareta Darcy. With the assistance of an Irish Parliament member and a therapist psychiatrist from Dublin, Millet was declared competent and released within several weeks. She returned to the United States, became severely depressed, and began taking lithium again. In 1986, Millet stopped taking lithium without adverse reactions. After one lithium free year, Millet announced the news to stunned family and friends. Millet's involvement with psychiatry caused her to attempt suicide several times due to both damaging physical and emotional effects, but also because of the slanderous nature of psychiatric labeling that affected her reputation and threatened her very existence in the world. She believed that her depression was due to grief and feeling broken. She said, When you have been told that your mind is unsound, there is a kind of despair that takes over. In the Looney Bin trip, Millet wrote that she dreaded her depressed periods. At one point, listening to others talk about her freaking out, Millet muses, how little weight my own perceptions seem to have, and goes on, depression is the victim's dread, not mania. For we could enjoy mania if we were permitted by the others around us. A manic person permitted to think 10,000 miles a minute is happy and harmless and could, if encouraged and given time, perhaps be productive as well. Ah, but depression, that is what we all hate. We the afflicted. Whereas the relatives and shrinks, they rather welcome it, you are quiet and you suffer. Topic. Views on mental illness Millet disputed diagnoses and labels like manic depression bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia, which she claimed are placed upon people who exhibit socially unacceptable behavior. Many healthy people, she said, are driven to mental illness by society's disapproval and by the authoritarian institution of psychiatry. She attributed her own depression to her diagnosis, and not the other way around, writing, When you have been told that your mind is unsound, there is a kind of despair that takes over. Millet documented her experiences in the book The Looney Bin Trip. 1990. Feminist author and historian Marilyn Yalom wrote that. Millet refuses the labels that would declare her insane. Continuing, she conveys the paranoid terror of being judged cruelly by others for what seems to the afflicted person to be a reasonable act. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Activism. Angered by institutional psychiatric practices and lenient involuntary commitment processes, Millet became an activist. With her lawyer, she changed the state of Minnesota's commitment law so that a trial is required before a person is involuntarily committed. Millet was active in the anti psychiatry movement. As a representative of Mind Freedom International, she spoke out against psychiatric torture at the United Nations during the negotiations of the text of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. 2005. In 1978, Millet became an associate of the Women's Institute for Freedom of the Press. WIFP. WIFP is an American non-profit publishing organization. The organization works to increase communication between women and connect the public with forms of women-based media. Topic. Bowery redevelopment 
In the late 1990s and early 2000s, Millet was involved in a dispute with the New York City authorities, who wanted to evict her from her home at 295 Bowery as part of a massive redevelopment plan. Millet and other tenants held out, but ultimately lost their battle. Their building was demolished, and the residents were relocated. Scholarship <laughs> 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 Kristen Poirot, author of Mediating a Movement, Authorizing Discourse, says that the release of Millet's Sexual Politics 1970 was a pivotal event in the second wave of the feminist movement. Although there were other important moments in the movement, like the founding of the National Organization for Women and release of the feminine mystique by Betty Friedan, it was in 1970 that the media gave greater attention to the feminist movement, first with a front-page article in the New York Times and coverage on the three networks' news programs about the women's strike for equality event that summer. Millet used psychology, anthropology, the sexual revolution, and literary criticism to explain her theory of sexual politics, which is that Western societies have been driven by a belief that men are superior to women. According to Poirot, the book, which received widespread media coverage, was considered to be the first book-length exposition of second-wave radical feminist theory. Published accounts of Millet's lesbianism played a part in the fracture in the feminist movement over lesbians' role within the movement and reduced her effectiveness as a women's rights activist. Millet wrote her autobiographical books Flying and Sita about coming out as gay, partly an important consciousness raising activity. She realized beginning an open dialogue is important to break down the isolation and alienation that hiding in privacy can cause. She wrote in Flying what Alice Henry calls in her Off Our Backs review of Sita an excruciating public and political coming out, and its effect on her personal, political, and artistic lives. While she discussed some of her love affairs in Flying, in Sita she provides insight into a lesbian love affair and her fears of being alone or inadequate. Henry writes. Kate's transparent vulnerability and attempts to get to the root of herself and grasp her lover are typical of many women who love women." Millet recorded her visit to Iran and the demonstrations by Iranian feminists against the fundamentalist shift in Iran politics under Khomeini's government. Her book Going to Iran, with photography by Sophie Kier 1979, is a rare and therefore valuable eyewitness account of a series of important developments in the history of Iranian women. Albeit told from the perspective of a feminist from the Western world, scholar Camille Paglia described Millet's scholarship as deeply flawed, declaring that, American feminism's nose dive began when Millet achieved prominence. According to Paglia, Millet's sexual politics reduced complex artworks to their political content and attacked famous male artists and authors for their alleged sexism thereby sending serious academic literary appreciation and criticism into eclipse. <laughs> Death Millet died in Paris on September 6, 2017 from cardiac arrest, eight days before her 83rd birthday. Her spouse, Sophie Kier was with her at the time of her death. Awards and honors Millet won the Best Books Award for Mother Millet from Library Journal in 2001. In 2012, she was awarded one of that year's Courage Award for the Arts by Yoko Ono, which Ono created to "...recognize artists, musicians, collectors, curators, writers—those who sought the truth in their work and had the courage to stick to it, no matter what." And Honor their work as an expression of my vision of courage. Between 2011 and 2012, she was also awarded the Lambda Pioneer Award for Literature and a Foundation for Contemporary Arts Grants to Artists Award 2012. She was honored in the summer of 2011 at a Veteran Feminists of America Gala. Attendees included feminists such as Susan Brownmiller and Gloria Steinem. In March 2013, the U.S. National Women's Hall of Fame announced that Millet was to be among the institution's 2013 inductees. Beverly P. Ryder, board of directors co president, said that Millet was a real pillar of the women's movement. The induction ceremony took place on October 24, 2013, at the National Women's Hall of Fame headquarters in Seneca Falls, New York. Topic: 
Topic Works Topic Exhibitions Some of her exhibitions and installations are 1963 Minami Gallery, Tokyo 1967 Group Exhibition, 12 Evenings of Manipulation, Judson Gallery, New York City 1968 Situations, Brooklyn Community College, New York 1970 The American Dream Goes to Pot, The People's Flag Show, Phoenix Art Museum, Judson Memorial Church, New York 1972 Terminal Peace, Women's Interart Center, New York 1973 Small Mysteries, Woman Style Theater Festival, New York 1977 Naked Ladies, Los Angeles Women's Building, California 1977 Solo Exhibition, Andre Wouters Gallery, New York 1977 The Lesbian Body, Chuck Levitan Gallery, New York 1978 The Trial of Sylvia Likens, NoHo Gallery, New York 1979 Elegy for Sita, NoHo Gallery, New York 1979 Women's Caucus for Art 1980 Group Exhibition, Great American Lesbian Art Show, Los Angeles 1980 Solo Exhibition, Lesbian Erotica, Gallery de Ville, New Orleans, Second Floor Salon 1981 Solo Exhibition, Lesbian Erotica, Gallery des Femmes, Paris 1986 Group Exhibition, Feminists and Misogynists, Center on Contemporary Art, Seattle 1988 Fluxus, Museum of Modern Art, New York 1991–1994 Cortland Jessup Gallery, Provincetown, Massachusetts 1992 Group Exhibition, Body Politic, La Mama La Galleria 1991 Solo Exhibition, Freedom from Captivity, Cortland Jessup Gallery, Provincetown, Massachusetts 1997 Kate Millett, Sculptor, The First 38 Years, Fine Arts Gallery, University of Maryland, Catonsville 2009 Black Madonna, Multimedia Show of 41 Artists, H. P. Garcia Gallery, New York Topic Books Author Millett, Kate 1970. Sexual Politics Garden City, New York, Doubleday. OCLC 489817513. Millet, Kate 1971. The Prostitution Papers, A Candid Dialogue. Falmouth, Paladin. OCLC 320856459. Millet, Kate 1974. Flying. New York, Alfred A. Knopf. ISBN 978-0-394-48985-8. Millet, Kate 1976. Sita. London, Virago. ISBN 9780860680242. Millet, Kate 1979. The Basement, Meditations on a Human Sacrifice. New York, Simon & Schuster. ISBN 978-0-671-24763-8. Millet, Kate 1981. Going to Iran. New York, Coward, McCann and Gagan. ISBN 978-0-698-11095-3. Millet, Kate 1990. The Looney Bin Trip. New York, Simon & Schuster. ISBN 978-0-671-74028-3. Millet, Kate 1993. The Politics of Cruelty, An Essay on the Literature of Political Imprisonment. New York, London, Norton. ISBN 978-0-393-03575-9. Millet, Kate 1995. A.D., A Memoir. W. W. Norton. ISBN 978-0-393-03524-7. Millet, Kate 2001. Mother Millet. London, Verso. ISBN 978-1-85984-607-0. Co-author Millette, Kate, Odell, Kathy, Berger, Maurice 1997. Kate Millett, Sculptor, The First 38 Years. Catonsville, Maryland, Fine Arts Gallery. ISBN 0-9624565-9-4. Articles or book chapters 
Millet, Kate. Summer 1998. Out of the Loop. On the Issues magazine. Millet, Kate. 2005. Theory of Sexual Politics. In Cud, Anne E., Andreessen, Robin O., Feminist Theory, A Philosophical Anthology, Oxford, UK, Malden, Massachusetts, Blackwell Publishing, pp. 37-59, ISBN 1-4051-1661-7 Millett, Kate The Illusion of Mental Illness in Stasny, Peter, Lehman, Peter, Alternatives Beyond Psychiatry, Berlin Eugene, Oregon, Peter Lehman Publishing, pp. 29-38, ISBN 9780978839789 Millett, Kate 2014. Preface. In Burstow, Bonnie, Lefrancois, Brenda, Diamond, Shainel, Psychiatry Disrupted, Theorizing Resistance and Crafting the Revolution, Montreal, McGill, Queen's University Press, ISBN 9780773543962 Millett, Kate 2015. Women's Liberation Cinema Company, 1971. Producer Not a Love Story, a film about pornography documentary. National Film Board of Canada NFB, 1981. Herself, writer, artist Bookmark, Daughters of de Beauvoir one episode biography. British Broadcasting Corporation BBC, Union Pictures Productions, 1989. Herself Playboy, The Story of X documentary. Calliope Films, Playboy Entertainment Group, 1998. Herself The Real Yoko Ono television, 2001. Herself Des Fleurs pour Simone de Beauvoir documentary short in French. France. 2007. Herself <laughs> Notes <laughs>